most of you all have a version of this role somewhere or another. You may call it a project manager, maybe you call it a traffic manager, maybe you call it an operations person. It doesn't really matter. There tends to be a role in every organization that's just trying to keep the wheels on the bus, trying to get work out, trying to keep organized, trying to make sure you can get as efficient as possible. Well, we've assembled a really phenomenal panel of, of folks that are experts in this field, ranging um, from agencies and, and big org organizations, even like PGI, and we're really excited to have this discussion around um, really what are the different characteristics that people are trying to look at when um, deploying project management technique and, and sort of in their organizations and so forth. Um, so we're going to have a panel discussion with a number of folks that are actually customers of Sensor Desktop, um, which is really exciting. Frank Nardi is going to be our moderator. Frank works on our team in the services business here at uh, Central Desktop. He's going to be moderating it and joining us as well on the panel. And then I'm going to get off the stage because you want to hear from them, not me. Um, we have Melissa Gordon with Leopard, Shannon Layton with Leopard, Wendy Niebank with PGI, and Nada Sadi Smith with uh, Young and Rubicon YNR Austin. So please join me in welcoming all of those great people to the stage. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Good luck. This is great. That's good. All right, before, before we get started, I want to get some app points. Because <laughs> I want to catch Sue Ellen. There's no count. So I'm going to see if I can get this crowd, beautiful crowd. Great. All right. So um, yeah, we're going to get started here. One of the things that um, I'm a big quote guy, and um, I like the quote by Eisenhower. He said, uh, no battle was ever won according to plan. No battle is ever won without one. And that's really the description that I think of when I think of the life of a project manager, uh, specifically in the ag agency and marketer space. So I want to get this started. Um, just please describe your role. We'll start uh, with you, Shannon. Please describe your role within your company, um, what your company does, and, and the clients you serve. And then we'll go down, okay. down the line. Okay. Uh, I'm Shannon Layton. I'm with, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to hog it. I'm Shannon Layton. I'm with Leopard um, out of Denver. We're an Ogilvy and Mather agency. I am Vice President Director of Creative Operations. So I manage a lot of our processes, resource management, all outside production and vendors, hiring of freelancers. Um, it's just a really a general um, process management type of role in our agency. Hello, I am Melissa Gordon. I am an account executive at Leopard, work with Shannon. Um, I'm responsible for client management and project management, so we don't have a pure project management role. I get to do both, which is always exciting. But yeah. I am Nada Saidi Smith. Um, I'm from Austin, uh, here in town at YNR, and I am vice president of account operations. And my role is actually combined in that I oversee the account service department, but also the project management department. Um, that actually makes my, my world a little bit interesting. Good morning. I'm Wendy Niebank. I'm with um, PGI, Vice President of Global Services Project Management. I basically run an organization that implements some of the largest um, global accounts for PGI. So, Wendy. What, what uh, you talked about a little bit, but what does your project mix look like? Is it long term, short term? Is it a, a breadth of both? It, it really kind of covers both because a lot of our accounts are large globals. Yeah. Most of my projects aren't quick. Um, quick for us is somewhere between 90 and 120 days uh, because we move at the pace of our customers uh, versus moving at the pace that PGI sometimes would like to go. Um, but, you know, currently I'm working on a project that's. Uh, been over a year in the making that we just launched this weekend. Oh, great, great. And now the same question for you is like, what type of uh, projects are you working on long term, short term? I think that most of our projects fall in the shorter term realm and in, in the grand scheme of things, really. I think the longest project might be three months um, on the high end, but we have projects that we need to turn in five days. Um, so, you know, Anywhere from five days to maybe three months. And you guys the same? Yep, same, same thing. I think um, one of the longer uh, projects we've had was been uh, web development. So we have done those longer ones. And like you said, sometimes we want it to go faster than it actually ends up going. 
Um, but yeah, same thing. Sometimes it's just a quick turn, a couple days, and then some are, are more long. Okay. It's funny, the, the way I've seen things change over time is our clients are wanting things faster and faster. So we might go into a project with only a month. You know, that's what the expected delivery date is. And it really wasn't meant to be done in a month. Like the client really wasn't in that big of a hurry and they ended well, they up stretching. Count, they count Saturdays and Sundays. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they, you know, the project ends up going three months. Yeah. So it wasn't what we ever expected in the, in the beginning, but it ended up stretching out and becoming this long-term project that was never meant to be that way. So it makes right. the project management side of it an interesting one. Yeah. So with that said then, what are some of the most common challenges you guys are facing at Leopard that, that's keeping you up at night when you, when, in, in terms of project management? Um, I guess for us, um, in just in my role, it's the resource management side of it. So when these projects that come in and they're supposed to be you know, a quick turn and they end up stretching out a lot longer than they were ever planned to be. It's managing those resources. It's, you know, you're having to do a juggling act constantly and moving things around, make sure, making sure you've got that same team still available to keep going on those projects that have turned into something they weren't supposed to be in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, go ahead. I was gonna say, and so for some of these longer term projects, Wendy, um, what are some of your challenges there? And that's what's keeping you up at night there. I mean, really one of the biggest challenges is keeping the team motivated through that kind of duration, um, especially on some projects, you end up sprinting kind of the whole way through um, because they were meant to be shorter or something like that and, and trying to keep people engaged and motivated through that duration, um, number one challenge. Yeah, and not a same person. I think that also balancing the budget with that. So if you've got a project that's supposed to be six weeks long and for one reason or another, it ends up being a multi-month project, um, you know, balancing why those delays happened, where there are opportunities to go back to the client and potentially ask for more budget. Um, but but basically trying to keep things as lean as possible even though the duration has stretched. Got it, good. So project management, I think we've talked about a little bit here, it's about managing those resources, it's managing the scope, it's time and cost. Um, what does it take to do that effectively? So how, what are you juggling on a daily basis that's allowing you to, to, to have that kind of control that you need to be effective? Um, well, I think that prior to us um, utilizing central desktop, I think we had, we had um, processes in place, we had systems in place, but we didn't have everything all in one place so that um, everybody was on the same page. Um, now, utilizing central desktop, we're able to include uh, the amount of hours that each resource has. Uh, it's it's right there for them. So, you know, they can see what work they need to do and then they can see how many hours they have to do it. Um, so I, I think that combined with the efficiency of just having everything in one place versus how we had it before, which is it, it might mean going to five or six different places or five or six different people to, to try to find the information that someone needed. Yeah, totally, yeah. totally get that. I think what tools like that do, like Central Desktop, it gives everybody accountability. Like each person is responsible for knowing when something's due, how long they have to do it, what the next step is, the process is. They're not shoving it back to the project manager and say, okay, my part's done, check, and then I'm gonna forget about it. You know, with a specific tool set up, you can see exactly what the next step is. So if I'm a writer, I, need, I know it needs to go to edit, and then it needs to go to this part, and then we're sending it to the client. So it's not just, going back to the project manager and making it one single person's responsibility to keep things moving, it turns it into a group responsibility. And so if I'm not here, like I'm not <laughs> today, um, you know, I have faith that the team can, they have what they need to keep projects going so everything just doesn't shut down when one person walks away. Right, removing those bottlenecks. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Anything to add? Uh, no. Oh, perfect, all right, that's a good question then. All right, so is this, is this um, different for you, Wendy, or is this different now than in the past? Like anything as far as like managing that time, scope, budget, at this, you know, juggling? 
So actually, in terms of managing the triple constraints, for it becomes Yeah, I was going to use that term, but <laughs> I'm glad you so, said it. So, so yeah, so the, the triple constraints for us shifts customer by customer. So I have some customers that are very budget focused. I have other customers that are very schedule focused, and then other ones that want their scope no matter what and are willing to, you know, so in, in my world where everything I'm taking in is a customer implementation, it's being driven by that customer, we have to adapt our practices and how we kind of manage through it based on what the customer needs are. Um, and so the biggest challenge I've got really is getting the team to realize which segment is their customer most sensitive to. Great, great. So um, another question here is like, we're talking about proper planning, we're talking about um, the three constraints, but the client calls, makes those changes, even though they may go down, you know, time is the most important, now all of a sudden cost is the most important. How are you, um, how are you rolling with those punches and, and making those changes on a daily basis? So the biggest thing that you have to, I think, ask yourself is how big is this change? So is it a small thing that you can easily just roll in? And, and you have to be able to do that assessment fairly quickly. So is it something we can just roll in? It's um, early enough in the process that it doesn't have a huge impact on the tail end? Or is it something that's really huge um, and is gonna add you know, huge amounts of resource hours or other things? And then you have to ask the, what I call the should question. So should we do this? Is it yeah. the right thing for the customer? Is it the right thing for you know, PGI? Um, those sorts of things. And then working with the customer through that conversation. And same thing for you, Nada, when you're talking about the fast turn projects, the timelines are getting shorter. How are you rolling with the punches as you have a production meeting on a Monday morning after a client call on Friday and the meeting changes everything? Um, how do you roll with those punches? I think uh, communication is the biggest thing. Uh, you know, do we need to have a, um, a flash meeting to get everybody together and talk about uh, a change in scope? I think that um, from the account service side, making sure that the question, the right questions are asked. Why does this change need to happen? Or why does this additional scope need to happen? You know, what is the due date based on? Um, because sometimes we find out that maybe there's another solution to, to what they're trying to accomplish. What are they trying to do with this? Um, because we get a lot of last minute requests that might, oh, we need this thing by this trade show. And if you ask a few more questions, you can figure out um, maybe there's a, another way to get it done, um, that sort of thing. Great, great. So um, back to Leopard, you were talking about um, some resource management and, and timelines getting shorter. So as they're getting shorter, resources are tight, um, a client comes in or even uh, a senior level comes in and says, hey, we need to meet these expectations. Um, you know. How do you manage that part of it when the expectations may be beyond what you can you know, physically do and then the resources? Well, at Leopard, we actually, our business model keeps us as a very slim staff. So we are able to um, bring in the right vendors or freelancers to, to accomplish the work that we need to do for our clients in the, in the time frame that we're given. So we've got um, a really great pool that's growing constantly of freelancers that we can reach out to. If we can't, if we're already maxed out internally, um, which is where Central Desktop helps out a lot because I have a special report built and that's where I can completely see, if schedules are up to date, I can completely see what everyone has on their plates just by you know, going down the list of different names and I can pull up their calendars. So the resource management part of it, that report that I use is, it's uh, it's priceless to me. Oh, that's great. That's <laughs> I, great. I live in that report. And you guys, you guys spin up like external users when you're we in do. your busy season, and we, that allows them to come in. We, and we bring all of our freelancers into the system. They are treated just like any internal team member in there. Um, so they are expected to watch the schedule there. They are expected to do all of their communications within that workspace, just like the rest of us are. And should be, they should expect to be communicated that way. And that's you know an expectation of our entire teams. It's, that's where the communication is happening. It's not happening in outside emails. Um, we've got that one central place, and everybody knows that's where you should be able to go to get your information. Great. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, Shannon, without Shannon, I don't know how work would get done <laughs> at our agency. Um, you know, it, it is sometimes a little challenging when, you know, you build the schedule and let's say it's a three month plus project and you spend all day building this meticulously beautiful schedule and then the client calls tomorrow and they throw three wrenches in it or the timeline changes or, you know, it's gonna happen, it just happens. So I think what's challenging as I'm slaving over that schedule that first day, it's frustrating because I know it's gonna change. However, I can't expect to get somebody assigned to my roles. Like I can't expect to have buy-in from the rest of my team unless I give that expectation up front and say, here's what I'm planning to happen. Here's based on the information I have today. I think everybody needs to know it's gonna change and I think in this industry, you just accept that right now. Um, but again, you know, just constantly, you know, if I do my part, then everybody else can do theirs. And, um, you know, even if I know projects aren't gonna go according to plan, just having that, even if it's my best guess, I know helps you do your job and, and everything just kind of keeps moving a lot more efficiently. And that's great. You know, it, it falls back to the project managers because we rely on those schedules so much to get things done. Yeah, and I know it's a tough thing to do because our schedules change every day, which I'm sure yours do too, that you know, to keep those schedules up to date, it's work, but it's, it's such a necessary part of things um, for us to be able to see what's, what's real and what's, you know, what's coming. So it's, it's a lot on the project manager's plates, but it's, it's definitely a necessary part of it. So. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. <laughs> and, and Wendy, same thing. So you've got this longer project, right? You're trying to manage expectations on a longer project, um, do you use like a burn down? Like how do, you, how do you sort of scale out those resources for something that could last, you know, 18 months? So a lot of the projects we do um, have multiple departments involved in them. So I've got to get networking involved at certain times. I've got to, so what I try and do is do a kickoff with everybody, kind of outline what's going on, but then come back because they don't all need to be engaged throughout the entire process. Um, so engagement at the time people need to be brought in makes the resources more efficient at doing what they need to do, but yet having the same kickoff and touch points throughout helps kind of gate it, keep people engaged like and informed. It's like a cadence that you're creating. That's yeah. great, that's great. What role is um, technology in your current process and how do you see it um, being leveraged more in the future? Like where do you see that going? So today we've leveraged technology for each customer engagement um, and we've got a variety of tools and things we use for that. Um, but what we're trying to do is bring it more together and centralized um, because we are starting to get into situations where you know, how do we sequence this customer against that customer in some of the products against some of the resources that we've got? Sure. And so that's more the direction we're going in 2016. Great, and same for you, Nada. I think one of the biggest things is taking, um, when we brought Central Desktop on and started utilizing it, um, up until that point, and this was a few years ago, up until that point, um, there were certain things that we were still doing, what I would consider manually. So if there was an ad, that needed to go through um, for review to the, you know, the account manager, the copywriter, the art director, um, basically routing to the, the different stakeholders um, before going to the client, we would um, do a physical route. I mean, we, we have ads that we still can't find. They're, you know, they're lost in the office somewhere. People don't, you know, they're buried in a pile somewhere. And so um, that was one of the first things that we did with Central Desktop was to get out of, you know, the Stone Age and, and start um, using that technology to route what we're calling now electronically. Um, so I think that's one of the, the greatest um, improvements that we've made. Great. And you guys as well, you're... Yeah, I mean, like Shana said, everything, all communication goes through Central Desktop and it's, you know, you still get the emails, like it's not like we're going away from email, but um, our email system isn't my favorite and so it's nice to go back and not, no, I don't have to search through emails to catch up on what's been happening. I can just go to the tool, I go to our project page and I can just scan quickly through the past few conversations. I don't grab the wrong file because we all are supposed to put something on the server and it's supposed to be the most up to date, but everybody knows that doesn't always happen. But generally, the most up to date version gets shared. So I almost trust the tools that we have in place versus 
the process, you know, and, and knowing that that's kind of where things are being shared out. So I'm never going to grab the wrong version. It's very, very clear, um, you know, and, and the way that we use it. I mean, we, we have 100% adoption of the tool, so we know we know where it's coming from. And just to add to that, I think that also goes back to the resource allocation, because if you all of a sudden have um, a project that's been dead for a while, and then you need to bring in someone from the outside, a contractor or a, a different resource to pick it up, um, all you have to do is add them to that particular workspace, and then they have everything they need right there, versus what we used to do was having to get people up to speed, you know, um, and, and that just was not... Um, just put a stack of papers on their desk. And <laughs> basically, yeah. yeah. And then walk them through everything. Lock them, lock them in the closet. Yeah. It's, it's now a completely digital thing, because the days uh, you know, long ago where we had the paper job jacket, it's, you, know, you had stamps on everything, the traffic manager was walking around to everybody's office getting those sign-offs and marking things up. And I used to do that. I used to be that traffic person walking. I mean, that was half my day, just walking around to everybody getting their sign-offs. And now we have, it's t I call it a digital job jacket. Absolutely everything so is So now right what, there. what do you guys do for exercise then? <laughs> Not because all that's anymore. gone, right? Yeah, I'm sure to... gained a lot of weight since well, my we, traffic days. We know what you, yeah, it's, it's, right. It's core. It's all core. Yeah. Um, so, talking about collaboration, we've we've talked about it a few times. It's not having that one person that sort of linchpin, that that bottleneck. It's about getting everyone involved. Um, where, describe for us like a breakdown, a typical breakdown where that doesn't happen and what that looks like and how you've worked to sort of overcome those situations? Um, you know, it's, it's all about communication and it, the, like central desktop is a tool, it's only as good as what goes into it. Um, so there's still, there's a level of communication there and there's a level of communication that still has to be had face to face. Um, so if somebody's not communicating correctly, either through the tool or in person to the rest of their team, that's the main place any kind of breakdown will ever happen. It's, you know, it, the information, if it's there, it's there for everyone to see. Um, and it, like I said, it's as good as what you put into it. That's so. great. Yeah, we have a term for that. It's called uh, not good stuff go in, <laughs> not good stuff coming out. Like this one. But, um, what about you guys? Like a, not a, a typical breakdown in your business when collaboration is not happening. I think that's a tough one. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, you can pass. Yeah, I'll pass and I'll think on it. <laughs> I'll use my pass. Um, I think some of the biggest breakdowns that we have are really around language. So since we deal with um, customers in a global environment, um, having people with, with multiple um, linguistic skills, let's call it, in terms of typically calls are conducted in English, but it may be a, a third or fourth language for, for people that we deal with. And so one of the things that we found very helpful is we do use Central Desktop to put our project materials out there and share those, that space with our customers. And combining both the meeting calls, but the, also the materials, putting it out in the space where people can kind of read it offline, it helps a lot to really drive better understanding and, and truly connecting with them on what was said and meant during the meeting um, in a way that if you just had kind of a verbal communication um, while it was live and they all participated, by taking it back and reading it, they digest it a little bit more and it makes it a more productive collaboration and communication. Yeah, and you mentioned being able to do this um, offline too, so you probably, with Global, you've got time zone things that you're constantly juggling. Absolutely. Great. Okay, I'm ready now. You're ready? Oh, this is fantastic. <laughs> All right, go. Okay, so I guess um, something I was thinking about is that uh, we had to learn um, in the beginning that we had to separate the technology from the process. So. Where breakdowns happen is not in the technology, the breakdown is in the process. So um, we, when we first started, we mapped out our process. Um, we had a lot of people go through Lean Six Sigma training. We utilized that um, to, to fine tune our processes. And then 
we mapped the technology to that. So I think when things break down, it's because somebody's not following the process. So we had a recent example where someone went, you know, instead of going back to the project manager or going back to um, the account manager, they went directly to the writer. Um, and then meanwhile, something else was happening. And so it, it was just a big cluster. So just rogue, they went rogue. Yeah, they went rogue. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that that is, um, is just really not following the process that's in place. Okay, and, and that actually leads to my next question. So how often, how often are you reevaluating that process? Is this a monthly thing, a uh, yearly thing? We, um, we have a process team. We have a lot of teams at the agency. We've got a social team and a brand team, and um, we've got a process team. And so we meet every other week. And um, what, what we ask for is for people to just give us feedback on things that aren't working. And then we'll meet um, every other week. We'll talk about those things. We'll come up with ideas on how to fix the process. Some could be what we call a quick win, where it's just like, okay, just implement this and that's fixed. We shoot an email out or a, um, a post, an announcement on Central Desktop, let, it, let everybody know what they should be doing. We update um, process documentation that goes along with that. So I think we're constantly fine tuning. Um, and so we are meeting every other week. That's great. So for you, it's really iterative. It's like yes. continuous improvement. Yes. Great. How about you, Wendy? Ours is a much longer time frame. Um, so I generally make a change and hold it for about three months. Um, because the team gets into what I call analysis paralysis on changes. <laughs> oh, let's tweak that. Okay, let's tweak that. And so yeah. we spend all our time actually tweaking the process versus doing the process and, and supporting our customers. So we kind of launch it, gather the feedback over duration, and then kind of quarterly come in, review, and make adjustments. Oh, great, great. And how about you guys? Yeah, I don't know if we're officially evaluating ours very often, but I think personally, as a project manager, you have to evaluate your own process each and every project. Like one way of doing things isn't gonna fit for one client versus one type of project. So um, I think what's nice about Leopard is that because we worked so closely together, I can t get feedback immediately from my team and hey, do you like it when I create this? Do you like it when we have meetings on Tuesdays or should we do it on Fridays before we go to the weekend? You know, having those kinds of conversations and, and not just getting stuck in, hey, well, I did it by the process, so you know it's not my fault that things are broken. Like, There's always something you can be doing and tailoring and customizing based on the project, the client, the team you're working with. I mean, you're working with creatives and technologists and different personality types. Some people need a face-to-face. -face. Some people don't want to see you. you know? So you have to be able to understand your team and know what's worked for them rather than force something on them and expect everything to go beautifully every single time. Um, we actually do it. We have a, a process team in place, and that we've identified recently that there are um, changes that we need to make um, just to make things better. Um, just making the actual process of how things move through um, and routing of files. So we've got the team in place. We just we got it the whole thing delayed a little bit by a big project. So we're hoping to come out of this uh, this week with a little bit more going into that those initial meetings to get things revamped. So. What we did is we, you know, we set a process at the very beginning, the very start of this, and we let it morph into the way that it was fitting. We didn't want to re just replicate what we were doing. We wanted something better and different, and we let it morph a little bit into where it needed to be at that time, and then have watched it and analyzed it to make sure you know, what we need to change, what's working, before we go into a phase like this where we start to change things, because change is hard for people. Yeah. Um, that's why we delayed the start of the whole process team because we were a crazy busy time and I'm like, I can't do this to people right now. Right. <laughs> so it's just choosing the right time to do it and making sure it's right when we do. Great. And one thing that I have found very helpful is um, with our process team, we have people from each department. So we'll have someone from accounting and we'll have, have someone from media and we have someone from the creative team, account service. Um, but also, I always like to have brand new employees on the team because so often they'll come from another agency and 
just be like, what are you doing? You know, and there are a lot of old timers who don't really want to change the process. But if, um, if someone new comes in and, and we can make a case for it, I think sometimes that's, that's the best way um, for change is to embrace some of the newer people and, and their ideas. And I agree with you on incorporating a representative from every area because they're going to see things, you know, an account person's going to see things so much differently than a copywriter would um, and vice versa. It's just, it's, it's important to include everybody or a representative crowd before you make changes like that. So, so how then do you manage like a, su a successful project beyond just meeting, meeting your deadlines and completion? Like, do you do any post-mortems and things like that? We actually, have, we just um, created a process um, where we're doing, it's, it's a, we don't want to call it a post-mortem because it's such a negative word, so we're trying to figure out a new name for it as well. But um, we have a survey in place that that's the, what's going to be the start of our post-mortem post process um, in a very anonymous one so that you can go through and, and I, did we, maybe there's 20 questions. Just pick a yes or no or I agree or I disagree kind of thing. And those results will get um, brought together at the end, looked at, and we will have a meeting, and everybody who can make it to that meeting, we will discuss what, what those findings were. And you can participate as much as you like in that. Um, and this is something we're just getting started with. Um, we've had random postmortems here and there, but we need to have them more to get a true, true feel for how things went. And we've got one particular project that was really large and affected a lot of the agencies. So that's going to be our, our guinea pig um, for the new process. So we're literally just getting going with that. Great. How about not a postmortem? Um, we don't have postmortems for every single project, um, but we do when we know that things didn't go exactly as planned um, and there were areas where we could improve. Um, we have had postmortems with our clients before um, where they've actually asked for them. We usually don't um, make a client have a postmortem unless they're asking for it, but um, I think they're very valuable. Um, one thing, Again, I think this is sort of all wrapped up in the process is the post-mortem, but then also we call the portfolio process. So, you know, so many times a project's done and completed and then we move on and we kind of forget, well, you know, what can we capture from that project from a portfolio standpoint? Um, also, one question that I think um, we need to ask in that post-mortem meeting um, that I think we have a tendency to forget was what were the objectives of, of this project? Um, did we did we meet the client goals? You know, what were the goals set out, um, both from a client standpoint, but also from from our standpoint? Um, you know, from a creative uh, success standpoint, um, metrics, etc. So we actually have both a formal internal and a customer facing postmortem on the projects. Um, because internal, sometimes you, you may want to talk about how you can process-wise and th those sorts of things get better. Um, the PMs for that particular effort is responsible for coming back into our team meetings and actually presenting the findings and things that they did so that there's group sharing and learning on that. Um, <clears throat> obviously, the customer side is shared with them, but we also follow up with a customer satisfaction survey on all the different implementations. So there's kind of a multi that process to that to gather kind of information at different levels. Great. So, uh, Wendy, uh, this is one of my favorite questions. So, every, <laughs> everyone involved in a project wants to find the quickest route to the exit. Um, <laughs> what are some of the ways you keep them disciplined and staying, you know, focused? Um, so, there's there's what I call muffin motivation. <laughs> so. <laughs> Seriously, um, it's, it's a little bit harder with a globally distributed team, but if, if you can, if there's ways that you can meet face-to-face -face for different times, I, I do actually like hand-bake goods and send them to people as a thank you. I really appreciate I'm a what big you did. Myself, so <laughs> I, I bake time. cookies during the Christmas season, so come, come by in Terminus for a tray. Yeah, so, so it, and it's, it's really about going that extra mile to come out of your way to say thank you, um, you know, for, for a job, you know, where they, especially when they go above and beyond for you. Um, but yeah, there's, there's also times when the harsh side comes out and 
we were talking about this actually earlier as we were prepping for this. And so, yes, I have locked people in a room with only water and not let them out for bathroom breaks until we got to an agreement on what we needed to decide on. So there, there are ways that you can do this in, in different scenarios um, in order to get what you need to get done in terms of supporting the project. I think that if you have a good schedule in place, I think people just look at it as individual steps. And if you're on track, then things go, even if it's a really long extended project, I think people just follow the steps and, and they just do what they need to do to get it done. I think when we run into trouble is when we might be going round after round after round after round on something. And the creative team and sometimes the account team starts to feel a little bit beaten down. So I do agree that's when the breakfast tacos and the cookies and the tequila and all of that good stuff comes in. Um, one thing that we, um, or tool that we implemented, I think it's maybe been, maybe it's been a year and a half now, is called You Earned It. And basically each employee gets a certain amount of points in this tool. And when you see somebody doing something good or you see that they need a little bit of recognition or they need um, to be their morale to be lifted up, you can award them points. Um, and then each of these points has a, has a monetary value. And then once you receive a certain amount of points, you... Um, can then cash those in for different rewards. So it might be a gift card or it could be a bike or a camera or, or whatever. And it's been a huge help in getting us through projects and um, getting morale really high when, um, when it's kind of dipped. I think just acknowledging, just saying thank you, is, it goes a long ways. Acknowledging the effort people are putting in, the time, the weekends, um, like we just came up with a really major project and people gave up multiple weekends in a row, time with their families, and then had to, then on top of finishing the project, had to travel worldwide um, just to, to follow through on everything. So it, just that acknowledgement of their time and their efforts uh, goes a long ways. Um, comp time, there's things like that as well. Like, you know, I know you've worked three weekends in a row. Um, please take a couple of days off. Um, it just it goes a long way to help you know heal heal them from what they've just been through. I think to your point, sometimes there's really nothing better than having someone's supervisor rec supervisor recognize them. That that simple recognition sometimes just makes all the difference in the world. It goes a long way, especially with tequila. Way. Yeah. <laughs> a thank you and a shot. Yes. Well, and we're also careful about what the next assignment is for that person too. If they just came off something that's really taxing on them personally, um, just you know, to watch and see, okay, maybe they need some time that you know, we'll put something completely different on them in like a week. Or it's just not gonna be a back-to-back -back same, you know, this animation project and then go right into another one. Because those kinds of things can really wear out. You know, I'm, I talk more of, you know, from the cre on the creative side of it as who I'm assigning that work to, but um, some variety um, with what's coming at them next helps a lot as well. So um, I guess we'll open it up to the audience for some questions. Anybody have any questions for the panel? Oh, Nick, you could always ask a question. Hi. So behavioral change is really hard, right? And old habits really die hard. And you've all taken that leap to move people to a technology, get them out of their old habits. And you went through some of the things that you did to, to overcome that. Are there any particular groups or people that you work with that anecdotally were just the most resistant to change and can you share those with us? And, and how did you overcome those? <laughs> yeah, change management is hard. Um, I didn't find, you know, like when, when I came on board with Leopard, they had no, no project management system whatsoever. They were in emails, um, Excel spreadsheets, those kinds of things. So this was something we brought on board immediately. Um, so getting people, it, it was an abs, it wasn't, it wasn't optional. Like, you have to start using it on this date. You will use it this way. Um, but there's always people who, you know, they don't want to do a schedule. They don't, they don't want to do this. So they'll go around and just do an email. Um, 
so for us, it's I'm on every single project that goes through our agency. So I'm kind of that traffic cop watching things as well. So I know every agency can't have that one person watching things, but you know I've got to I've got to catch it as it happens, and it keeps us on a track of you know it's a process. We need to all need to work this way, and you know it might be a little hand slap here and there, but. Um, it's just, it's just re-educating people constantly. Was there anyone in particular? Was there there's anyone a in particular? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a couple. But it's it's not any one particular role though. It's you know there were account service people who were very set in how they liked to do things, and there were creatives who maybe weren't very um, tech savvy that found it harder harder to adapt uh, and adopt. Was did you move from old school to central desktop, or was there a lily pad in the middle there? It was very old school. They, right. um, but but they, was it right to central desktop, or did you use an interim solution before no, you got to central no. desktop? No. So when I came aboard, they had they had had an old system called Meconomy, that was also our accounting system and everything. It was very old school, and and they didn't have anybody enforcing the use of it. So some people were using it, some people weren't. There was no real process on how things needed to go through there. Um, so it was just being half used. And the company did, were like, we're not gonna continue to pay for this if no one's using it, but no one was also enforcing it either. So they let it go. And then when I came on board, it was literally just emails, Excel spreadsheets. There was just, there was no, nothing central. Everybody was doing things their own way. So it was, it was just something like, we had to do this. That's, there's no question about it. It's not optional. This is it. So in terms of productivity, did you see a, um, a dip go down first of all? Were you coming through the learning curve? Did you choose a particular time um, oh. of year when you decided to take it on? Maybe a quieter mm -hmm. time, perhaps? Well, we, it, it was probably a tough, you know, our fourth quarters are always very, very busy. And we actually brought Central Desktop on, gosh, was it October or November? So it was right before we got into our busy time, but it was, you know, it was any project, any new project that started after this date had to be in there. So it actually went pretty smooth, I felt. Um, had, you guys had, they had buy-in from the top. So our ECD was using it, you know, every single person was committed to using this. I think where I've seen it break down is when the creative director or the executive person, whatever, thinks that they're exempt from it and they just go behind the door and, you know, I'm gonna get my resource to do my secret project. Knowing that everybody goes through it, you know, that, that really helped and, and, you know, people wanna please upwards, so. <laughs> and what's nice about it is the, our agency knows that it's not optional and if someone does try and go around it, there are people who are not afraid to raise their hand and say, can you please put this in central desktop? Like, I, we can't have it working like this. And, and, it, and having, it's having that process team where there are people from all departments, I think really helps because mm -hmm. then you've got a champion in each department yeah. that is on board and will help to facilitate mm -hmm. the, um, the adoption. Yeah. One thing that we thought was that, um, you know, oh, we're, we know the people that are gonna be resistant. We know those, those particular people. And in fact, a lot of people surprised us. One, you involve them in the process, in the adoption. If they feel like they're part of the process, then they'll be more likely to um, to go along with it. We, after we implemented, um, we, we have 100% adoption. Everybody's using it. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have the trouble that we thought we might. Yeah. That's, yeah. Great. That's yep, great. Same here. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure being on this panel with you guys to today. And uh, thank you very much for your time. This was uh, Thank you. Thanks uh, for awesome. having us. Thanks, Frank.